Almost overnight, she went from a possible witness to a person of interest in the case of a missing mom of five from New Canaan. The girlfriend in the middle of a bitter and brutal divorce battle. The stuff you were throwing out, we have. And it's all Jennifer. It belongs to Jennifer. Do you understand? Turned high profile murder investigation. Guys, what happened to Jennifer McGregor? We're taking you inside the trial of Michelle Traconis. And thanks for joining us once again for Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. I'm Shannon Miller. After days of testimony leading up to this crucial moment, the state has called one of their key witnesses. Your Honor, the state calls for Val Gamini. Now, the former employee of the Four Group of Fotis Doulos' company, Pavel Gumieni, offered a first-hand account of the day Jennifer Doulos disappeared and the days that followed. He also spoke about what happened leading up to that day, including a comment he says Michelle Traconis made during a conversation about Fotis' dog having to be put down and Jennifer not allowing the kids to say goodbye. What exactly did she say? Um... Can I use bad words? Yes. She said that bed should be buried right next to the door. Now, Draconis maintains her innocence in all of this and has pleaded not guilty to all charges. Her family also showing their support outside the courtroom on another tough day for everyone involved. We'll hear what they had to say coming up. We want to bring in our Kevin Geis once again live from Stanford Superior Court. Kevin, this was big testimony for the state. What was the atmosphere and the mood like inside the courthouse? Shannon, good morning. It was big testimony, but the courtroom itself was incredibly calm. Everyone from the Traconis family to Michelle Traconis herself, the jury and the friends and family of Jennifer Dulos were hanging on every word that Pavel Gumieni had to say. Now, he was a reluctant witness admitting to the courtroom he was nervous about testifying. Gumieni telling the jury he's a family man with a wife and two children who came to the U.S. from Poland in 2000 and started working as a carpenter right away. He met Fotis Dulos in 2004 and then became his employee at the Four Group in 2016, and he was one of a few people who saw Michelle Traconis and Fotis Dulos the day Jennifer Dulos disappeared. Now, Gumieni testified that on May 24th, 2019, he had driven Dulos's Ford Raptor to work that day in New Canaan, but he wanted to get his Tacoma back. The Tacoma had a longer truck bed, so his dirt bike would fit in the bed of the truck. So he went to the 80 Mountain Spring Road property where he knew the truck was parked, where he found the defendant and Fotis Dulos. How did Mr. Doulos react when he saw you? The way I can say it, I look like surprised for a second or two. How did the defendant react when she saw you? About the same way. Gumieni is expected to be back on the stand today for a full day of testimony. Shannon. And what a day it was, Kevin, to finally uh, hear from Pavel Gumieni and all this. So Kevin, let's go back to that interaction at 80 Mountain Spring Road. One of the things that Gumieni noticed right away was Fotis Dulos' new hair coat, haircut. He even made a joke about it. And did you say anything to Mr. Dulos? Yeah, I made a comment about his hair. And when you say you made a comment about his hair, describe his hair for the jury. He was closely shaved. In 2019, how were you wearing your hair? Exactly the same way. So what did you say to Mr. Dulos about his hair? I, I told him, um, what are you doing? You, sh you, you shave your head, um, you wear, we're wearing dirty or work clothes. You, you're trying to be as handsome as me. And how did Mr. Dulos respond? I think he just smiled. You mentioned that they initially appeared surprised to see you, correct? Yes. Did the interaction ever change? Did, did it become more normal? Yes, after I made the joke. <laughs> Agumieni says that Fotis Dulos told him that he and Michelle Traconis were cleaning that property at 80 Mountain Spring Road. He said Michelle was cleaning the windows and he was cleaning something outside. How long had you known the defendant at this point? Um, Approximately. About two or three years. 
And isn't it true that in all those years you never saw her cleaning a project site? I never, I don't recall it. Again, Michelle Dracotis telling investigators that that house was going to be shown the next day. Now, Gumi again wanted his Tacoma back, so he testified that he asked Fotis and Michelle to drive to Ford Jefferson Crossing to drop off one of the vehicles, then come back to 80 Mountain Spring Road to get his truck, and that is when he noticed something. I got in a Raptor, um, and then I put the truck in reverse, and I look on the Tacoma, and I saw the... Uh, the key for my truck sticking from the passenger room. <clears throat> so I just want to be um, clear about this. When you say sticking from your passenger door, was it in the slot for the key? Yes. Did you retrieve your Tacoma key at that point? No, because I figured I'll be back there in five, ten minutes. Okay. Gumietti says he first went to Jefferson Crossing, then stopped at the four groups Deer Cliff Road property to unload some items. When he returned to Jefferson Crossing, Traconis was not there, he said. So he rode with Dulos in the Ford Raptor to get to Tacoma at Mountain Spring Road, and that is when he discovered that the keys were gone. When you arrived back at 80 Mountain Spring Road, was anyone present on the property besides you and Mr. Dulos initially? No. Did you see your Tacoma? Yes. Were the keys still in the passenger door of your Tacoma? No. Did you see your keys anywhere on the property at that point? No. Did you speak to Mr. Dulos about the fact that the keys were missing? Yes. What did Mr. Dulos say to you? He says that Michelle has a key. So he knew that she had the keys? That's what he told me, yeah. Did you know that the defendant was going to be taking your keys? No. Did you tell her while you were all present at 80 Mountain Spring Road that she had permission to take your keys? No. Did she ever tell you that she was going to take your keys? No. Did Mr. Dulos ever tell you that she was going to take your keys? No. Now, Gumiani testified that Fotis Dulos called him the next day to tell him that Jennifer was missing. When Gumiani returned to work after the holiday weekend on May 28th, he arrived at Jefferson Crossing to find Fotis Dulos and Michelle Draconis. Gumiani says Dulos told him then not to mention that Draconis had taken the Tacoma Keys. And I told him uh, that uh, once I get to, to 80 Mountain Spring Road to pick up my truck, there was no key for it. And, um, and he told me um, not to mention that, not to mention that Michelle had a key. So you brought up the fact that your key wasn't in Tacoma and Mr. Dulos told you not to mention that Michelle had the key? Yes. What were his exact words, if you recall? I can't remember. Um, let's let's not mention that, or or something like that. So, Kevin, this is the first time that the jury has heard about Michelle allegedly taking this key. That's according to Gamini. How critical is this to the state's case that Michelle Draconis was an active participant in this conspiracy to commit murder? It's an important link for prosecutors, ultimately pointing toward the Tacoma for prosecutors was key to this entire subtract the Tacoma all the way from Farmington down to New Canaan and back to Farmington. So for prosecutors, it's important to point out that Michelle Traconis was involved in allegedly keeping the Tacoma away from Pavel Gumieni. Fotis Dulos also multiple times brought up to Pavel that he could keep the Ford Raptor for Memorial Day weekend if he wanted to instead of taking his Tacoma. But he decided he wanted that Tacoma because he wanted to take his dirt bike back to his house. Now, during that meeting with Draconis and Dulos, Gumiani says Fotis took his phone as well and started looking through uh, Gumiani's call history. He later learned from police that the web search history and the call log had been deleted from his phone. Approximately how long did you have your phone? I want to say a few minutes, five minutes. And how far away was he from you when you when he had your phone? About... Six feet. 
What's the defendant doing as Mr. Doulos has your phone? She was standing right next to him. Did Mr. Doulos ever bring up writing a timeline? Yes. Tell the jury about that portion of the conversation. He told me that um, um, police took his phone, uh, that he spoke with his attorney, and he told him to to write down a timeline. And um, he told me to look through my phone and and write down where I was, who I was, why we throughout the day. <clears throat> what did you say when he told you to write down where you were throughout the day? I was surprised. I told him, and what am I going to do if police is going to come over and ask me? I'm going to pull out a piece of paper and read it to them. So you did not agree to write a timeline? No. Now, shortly after that is when Fotis Dulos repeatedly insisted that Gumieni change out the seats on his Toyota Tacoma. Dulos even told him to use a code word for when they talked about those seats. If we talk, talk about it on the phone, um, let's not call it seats, let's call it hardware. When Mr. Dulos indicated that he wanted to refer to the seats as hardware, how did you react? I didn't know what to say. I, I, I was... Shot. I, I just, I didn't say anything. Now, despite that conversation, Gumieni agreed to go to the junkyard and then searched for new seats. After this conversation, were you growing nervous or suspicious about Mr. Dulos? Yes. So why did you agree to go to a junkyard? I wanted to, I didn't want to lose my job. I, I, I had a wife, two kids. I, he was my main income, health insurance. Now, Gumiani also said he had a non-compete clause, so if he left his job with Fotis Dulos, he was worried he would have to move out of state because Fotis Dulos might take legal action. Al Dulos also told Gumiene, Kevin, that he shouldn't talk to police, that they would arrest him and deport him. Gumiene has a green card and a permanent resident card. He is a native of Poland, as he testified. And Kevin, uh, talk about then how the prosecution is laying out all the reasons why he would comply with Fotis Dulos in this case instead of going to investigators right away. Right, Gumye prosecutors, excuse me, have Gumieni sort of laying out all of the reasons that he's sort of stuck in this scenario, hoping to elicit some sympathy or empathy from the jurors for the situation that he was in. Gumieni is sort of stuck between offering information to police. He was one of the few people that saw Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis the day Jennifer Dulos disappeared. But at the same time, he also had to protect his family. He was stuck trying to ensure that he was able to maintain a job, like he said in testimony, maintain his health insurance, and it would have been a logistical nightmare for him, according to testimony. So he's trying to sort of maintain this balance between the two. But ultimately, we hear some testimony about some of the steps he took to ensure that if police came to him with questions, he would have something to provide. Yeah, so that junkyard search, Kevin, uh, as we know, didn't pan out after Fotis Dulos told him multiple times to replace those seats. Gumiani said he would go get the seats out of the porch then at the Deer Cliff property, and he testified that this was really quite an ordeal. He says the battery of the Porsche Cayenne was dead, so he had to go get a battery charger in order to get those seats out. He then tried to attach them to the Tacoma, but they were not compatible, so he ended up just leaving them unattached in the truck, and still he decided to keep those old seats. You indicated that you put them next to the Tacoma? Yes. Can you tell the jury why you did that? I wanted to um, keep him just in case if there's anything going on with the truck. If, if the police is asking about it, I just wanted to keep him next to it. Were you concerned at this point that those seats may have been used in a crime? I have my doubts, but I still, I still couldn't fit in my head that, that Dulos would go and, um, and do something to Jennifer. Something about that little voice we all have in our head, right? Algumiani testified earlier about the relationship he had with Jennifer Dulos. 
He says he met her shortly after meeting Fotis. How would you describe her? She was a good person, um, delicate, nice, friendly. Kumi Eni testified he would do odd jobs around the Dulos home there at Fort Jefferson Crossing for Jennifer, and he would drive her to the airport if needed, typically in the Chevy Suburban. You know, remember the DNA expert testified about Jennifer's DNA being found in Kumi Eni's Toyota Tacoma on Monday. Prosecutors asked him about if he ever drove Jennifer Dulos in the Tacoma, and he explained that there was one time. Did you ever drive her in your Tacoma? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that? Yeah, so uh, I think shortly prior to the divorce, um, she um, bumped into something with her Range Rover, and uh, she asked me if I could get some paint and touch up the bumper so Dulos wouldn't see it. Um, and I said that I have a friend who's a mechanic um, who lives in Ibrahim, and he can like fix the bumper, make it look like never ever happened for like $400. And she said, okay, so uh, so this is when I drove my truck and she drove the Range Rover to New Britain. And then once we left the Range Rover there, I gave her right in my truck back to Fort Jefferson. And you indicated that this was prior to the divorce. So I want to just clear this up. This was prior to her moving out of the house, correct? Yes. Now let's fast forward to when Jennifer was moving out of the house. This was an intense time for her when she made that decision to finally start moving items out of the house. Gumiani testified that he helped Jennifer out with moving when she asked him, but he kept that from his boss, Fotis Dulos. Did there come a point in time when uh, Mr. Dulos indicated to you that he and Jennifer were going to be separating? Yes. Do you remember when that was? I remember we were having a team meeting in the office, and then uh, he announced to everybody that they're, they are separated. Was Jennifer still living in the house at this point? Yes. And did Jennifer ever make any requests from you during that time period? Yes, she would um, um, ask me to move some of the stuff from her house to um, her family owned a house, I, I think it was Palm Bridge, house on the lake. So she would ask him a number of times to move some things from her house to, to the lake house. And would you do that for her? Yes. Why? Because I like her and I wanted to help out. Did you tell Mr. Dulos that you were doing this? No. Why not? At some point, I told Jennifer that I have to stop doing that because this is going to get me fired. Oh, we also heard about some animosity between the defendant, Michelle Traconis, and Jennifer Dulos. Gumiani testified that Fotis Dulos had a Labrador retriever back in 2019 and that the dog was sick and had to be put down. Here's what he had to say about a conversation he had with Fotis and Michelle Traconis. What did Mr. Dulos say when you asked if Beckham was... He said that Beckham is ill and he's going to have to put him to sleep. And um, he said something like, uh, can you believe that Jennifer won't even let the kids come over and say goodbye to, to the dog before we put him to sleep. Did you respond to that comment? I don't remember. And you indicated that the defendant was present. Did she say anything at that point? Yes. Tell the jury what the defendant said. She said um, the she should be buried right next to this dog. And when you say she, what exactly did she say? Um, can I use bad words? Yes. She said that bitch should be buried right next to this dog. And what was her uh, demeanor like when she said this? I. <sighs> I think she was um, trying to cheer, cheer Lulos up. He was like heartbroken that, that his dog is about to be put down. How did he react when she said this? I believe he, he just looked at, look at her. <clears throat> now, later in his testimony about what happened after Jennifer disappeared, 
Gamiani talked about a conversation he had with Draconis while they were moving wood around on the Jefferson Crossing property. And did the topic of Jennifer Dulos's disappearance come up? Yes. Who brought it up? Michelle. And do you recall what the defendant said to you about Jennifer Dulos's disappearance? Yes, so Michelle was upset that um, um, her and her daughter pictures were posted by the news online. Um, and she said, uh, I'm, I'm going to kill when she's going to turn up. And um, I said, don't say that. And she said uh, um, that she's going to be suing the news. She's writing down who posted what, what pictures. Now, amid this testimony, painting Draconis in a negative light, her family spoke outside of the courthouse, reading notes from the community about Michelle's character and maintaining her innocence. Michelle is an exceptional, loving parent, totally dedicated to raising her daughter. Michelle is responsible, thoughtful, caring and loving person who would not act in any way to harm anyone. Now, Kevin, kind of a, a tale of two Michelles here that the jury has heard now. The prosecution using Gumiani's testimony to enforce that there was some sort of animosity between Michelle Draconis and Jennifer Dulos. But in that second conversation, he testified that Draconis said she would do something to Jennifer when she turns up. Could that help support the theory that she did not know what was going on? It could. I would expect defense attorney John Schoenhorn to hit on that point almost explicitly. Uh, she says when she turns up. So ultimately, at this point, Michelle Traconis still believes that Jennifer Dulos is missing, which is likely what she was hearing from Fotis Dulos at this point. So I would expect defense attorney John Schoenhorn, once we get to cross-examination, to hit that point for the jury at least one more time, if not have him explain a little bit more about that conversation itself. And we heard her tell investigators in one of those interviews that uh, she thought she was under the impression that Jennifer might be hiding uh, in those early moments that they had heard about her disappearance. Michelle Draconis, a uh, protective mother. We know that much um, just from what we've heard from her family. Uh, Kevin, appreciate the very latest. We'll let you get inside to today's testimony. Ahead, more gripping testimony on Inside the Trial. Michelle Draconis coming up. We'll talk about what Pavel Gumiani witnessed when he says Fotis Doulos was trying to figure out if Jennifer's new Canaan home had surveillance cameras. He appeared to me to be uh, very nervous. I noticed that his breathing rate was elevated. He was breathing uh, at a higher rate than you would expect someone to be, just, you know, driving in a car. Um, I also observed uh, the carotid artery <clears throat> in his neck was pulsating, indicating that his heartbeat was beating pretty fast. Oh, one week ago, the jury heard that testimony from Sergeant Michael Buten about the first time he saw Pavel Gumieni. Welcome back to Inside the Trial, Michelle Traconis. Sergeant Buten testified that Gumieni's shirt was soaked in sweat, and that raised his suspicion. Tuesday, we heard Gumieni's version of that day in his own words. Were you nervous at this time? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, my heart is going. I, I just had a heated conversation with Dulos and, and, and I was just removing the seats and fighting with the big doors and the, and the, um, 585. <clears throat> well, let me ask you this. Were you, were you concerned about the fact that the police were at Mr. Dulos' home? I, it was, I, I didn't have time to think. It was, it was just, everything was happening fast. Now, that conversation with Dulos Gumieni described as a heated one. I just couldn't hold it anymore, and I, I just went off on him. I told him, um, What's up with my truck? Why did you clean it? And um, he smiled at me and says, because you were never going to do it. And I told him, seriously, why did you clean my truck? And he says, don't worry about it. 
there's nothing going on. Um, I went to Jennifer's house for Mother's Day. I gave her a hug. I hold the cat. Um, and then I came back, and then I was um, I was having the same clothes, and I was driving a truck. Um, there might be hair in it or something. I just want to clean everything. The police might come over, come in. Um, they find something, they can destroy my name, destroy the, the company name. No one's going to ever want to build it with me. Now, Gubi and he described Dulos as angry and even scared. Earlier, he testified that Fotis was hard headed and he did not like it when people said no to him. As we dive into this key testimony, there was information about surveillance cameras that we learned about for the very first time. Pavel Gumiani told the jury about a conversation he had had with Fotis Dulos and an audio video contractor about Jennifer's Wells Lane home in New Canaan. Specifically, Fotis was asking them if they knew anything about any sort of cameras on Jennifer's property. Mr. Dulos pulled out his phone and, and started showing uh, Dan Zeisler pictures of Jennifer um, home with uh, which I believe was um, motion detectors <clears throat> and starts asking him if those are cameras. And what did Mr. Zeisler say? I don't remember. I think he said they are not. And did you participate in the conversation yes. at all? What did you say? I said I don't think so. I don't think those are cameras. Now, Gumiani testified that he said Jennifer could buy small cameras to put just about anywhere, and he told Fotis, don't do anything stupid. Now, in an act of transparency, prosecutors actually brought out and showed the jury the immunity agreement that Pavel Gumiani just signed back in December with the current state's attorney. It was initially a verbal agreement with then state's attorney, Richard Colantolo. And it indicates that you will not be prosecuted in connection with this case unless you perjure yourself or act in contempt of court. Is that correct? Yes. Well, this is an agreement that the family of Michelle Traconis was upset about when they learned about it. Her attorney, John Schoenhorn, is expected to get a chance to cross-examine Pavel Gumiani today. And what he did or didn't know, just like what Michelle did or did not know, will surely again play a big role in all of this trial. That wraps up our exclusive Inside the Trial of Michelle Traconis streaming special. You can watch the trial live on our streaming channels when court starts around 10 a.m. We'll have live coverage on NBC Connecticut News starting at 4. And be sure to join us weekdays at 9 a.m. for more in-depth analysis of the trial as it continues to unfold. Thanks for watching.